Well, it's been a few weeks. Let's see if this thing turns on. Sweet. One, two, three. Beautiful. Welcome to the Night Club, guys. It's your host, the Night Wrencher. I've sort of made this kind of a uh, tradition now. This will be the third year in a row that I make a how to carburate your LS engine. Uh, and each year it does get a little bit more, not complicated, but I do have a lot more information for you guys. It makes it easier for you guys to do the swap because you have more options to choose from. My particular application, as most of you guys might know, it's a 5.3 out of a 2001 Suburban. It is using the Holley dual plane intake. Uh, it's using a 750 vacuum secondary carburetor. And up until recently, I switched over to the LS2 style coils from Daytona sensors. The ignition module that I am currently using is the Smart Spark LS, also made by Daytona sensors. And before that, I was actually running the MSD 6014. So in this video, we're going to quickly go through the, all the different options that you guys have when you go to swap a carburetor on your LS. I'm not going to go over like like the generic stuff that you need for a regular engine swap like headers and flex play transmission adapters things like that that's more focused for a separate video this video is going to be more focused on getting you the most bang for your buck in terms of carburetor swaps on an ls so first thing on the list right here is the intake manifold intake manifold selection is super easy you just have to verify if your engine has rec port or cathedral style port heads and that's super easy if the intake ports are kind of cone shaped you have uh, cathedral ports if they are square shaped then you have rectangular port and when you buy your intake if it's for an ls1 ls6 style you know that's cathedral port if it's like ls3 or ls7 or whatever you know it's going to be rectangular port and a lot of times when you buy the intakes it'll say uh, cathedral port rectangular port so you do have to know that the second option is if you want to go single plane or dual plane richard holdner has a lot of testing on those two intakes everybody knows that dual planes are great for bottom end torque and the single planes are great for top end racing if, if your engine is going to be primarily used for racing get a single plane if your engine's going to be primarily used for daily driving with a little bit of racing uh, get a dual plane because you are going to notice a difference in torque going from a dual plane to the single plane and vice versa the next thing you might want to do you don't have to but i like to is you can get a two inch spacer for your carburetor if you have enough hood clearance what this does is it gives a little bit of cushion for your carburetor to sit on to prevent any kind of heat soak uh, and it gives you a little bit more room for whatever uh, fuel lines and throttle linkage you might want to run but it's not necessary you don't need to run a carb spacer if you do happen to want to run one if it's a dual plane you're going to want to run either a four hole spacer or a two hole spacer which is left and right if you're running a single plane intake you're going to want to run the open spacer or the super sucker spacer both spacers uh, are really good just make sure you do get a plastic or phenolic spacer and you don't get a metal spacer because you're kind of negating the heat um, advantages when you switch over to an aluminum or metal spacer next thing we're going to focus on is the ignition system like I, like I mentioned before these are ls2 style coils but you can definitely run your regular stock truck coils because you're also going to need the stock truck coil harness that goes along with your stock ls and you're going to plug that into the harness that comes with whatever ignition system you guys decide to go with so you guys can see here you can see this older harness that's sitting right here that's going to be the harness for my uh, coils and the clear cleaner harness that's going to be the new harness for my SSLS. I used to have my ignition module uh, mounted right here but because the SSLS has a shorter uh, wiring harness I had to route it somewhere else so I ended up routing it to right here on the firewall. This particular module is called the Daytona Sensor Smart Spark LS made here in the USA. I was having a lot of issues with the MSD modules so i decided to skip on that for the third time 
and decided to switch over to Daytona and uh, I haven't had any issues so far. In addition to running the Daytona sensors box, I'm also running an external map sensor similar to the MSD 6010 box. And I believe the 6012 box also has an external map sensor, but both of those boxes are now, as far as I know, discontinued or they're on uh, limited supply because they're just so old. You really don't want to pick up one of those boxes. Your best bet for ignition boxes is probably going to be the Daytona sensor Smart Spark LS. Uh, you can get the 6014. It is, I think, almost $100 cheaper, but the reliability, as far as I've been able to tell, is just not there, especially not for daily driving. I drive this truck thousands and thousands and thousands of miles every single year, and I cannot afford to have it lose coil drivers. I can't afford it to lose the map sensor. I've had too many issues with my MSD box to continue using them, which is why I switched over to the SSLS when I started to lose I lost one or two coils they ended up dying they got really weak I decided to go ahead and get my hands on the entire set of the LS2 style coils and I can do very very clean easy cold starts just pumping the pedal a couple times and it will idle no problem next thing on the list is carburetor selection if you're running a 4.8 or 5.3 i do recommend either the 570 a 600 a 650 or a 670 all four of those sizes come in different varieties and you're going to want to make sure that the one you buy uh, is jetted close to whatever the application is if it's a hundred percent stock stock cam stock everything you're going to want to find something that has similar to 65 65 jets or 67 67 jets somewhere around there or 65 67 you're going to be really really close uh, with that kind of jetting the 670 is probably a little too big for these engines but if you do end up deciding to get a cam later a 670 will give you more than enough room to grow into if you end up getting a 4160 carburetor that does not have adjustable jets in the back, you're going to have a little bit harder time because LSs do need to be tuned. You, most carburetors that I've seen will not properly run the LS out on the street. They might be able to run it out on the track, but they will need a little bit of uh, adjustments when you get it out and going. If you're running a modified 5.3 or a 6 liter or a modified 6 liter, your options for carburetors are probably going to be 670, 750, and 780 are the three sizes that I would go with. If it's a mild 5.3 or a fairly stock 6.0, a 670 will be more than enough. If you plan to modify them a little bit further, probably beyond 450, 500 horsepower, you're going to want to step it up to a 750 or a 780 depending on what's available to you. Same things apply for jetting. I haven't done the jetting on a 6 liter personally, but I can't imagine that it's too much higher than what a 5.3 needs. I do assume it's going to be higher. The question is by how much. We don't know that. For fuel supply, you have a couple different options. You can either get a TBI style 15 PSI pump. You can get an EFI style 40 PSI pump. Another EFI style 60 PSI pump. Or you can get like a carburetor 7 PSI pump. Main differences between them is that anything above the standard carburetor carburetor pressure like six seven eight psi you're going to have to run a regulator uh, ideally you're going to want to run a regulator on all of them but supposedly on the holly pumps that have an internal regulator they're supposed to already be set for whatever a carburetor is supposed to be uh, set at but in my experience the having even just a regular regulator setting it to 5.5 psi you'll never have any kind of flooding issues or needle and seat issues if you want to run higher pressure pumps the only thing you're going to have to do is you're going to want to to run the appropriate fuel pressure regulator not all fuel pressure regulators run exactly the same you're going to need to know what the pressure of the pump that you're going to run is and also what pressure you want to drop it to the regulators you're going to want to run are bypass style i'm not even going to bother recommending deadhead style regulators the main difference between bypass style regulator and a deadhead style regulator is that when you turn the engine off a bypass regulator will allow the fuel to go back into the tank whereas a deadhead regulator will keep the fuel inside the fuel rail and if you let it sit and you let the fuel rail warm up if you let the carburetor warm up it's going to boil the fuel and within minutes you're going to have a vapor lock issue versus a bypass style regulator that after you get the same vapor lock from the engine sitting 
instead of the fuel overflowing the carburetor the fuel is actually just going to get fed back into the tank i'm going to have recommendations for the different parts that you guys are going to want to run depending on the options that you guys are thinking of if your stock fuel tank is not set up to run an efi pump i have a video on how to modify your pump to accept an efi pump or you can run an external pump that goes on your fuel rail in my experience i have more reliability out of an in-tank pump than i do an external pump uh, something about fuel cooling the pump as it sitting in there versus uh, sitting it on the rail and causing starvation sometime or it overheating or it having to pull too much from the tank depending on where it's installed you're going to run to run a supply line at least a 3 8 line from the tank forward and if you're going to run a return line you're going to want to run at least a 5 16 or 3 8 on the way back i've noticed that if you run a return line that is too small you're going to have an issue where your pressure will start to build up inside the return line and thus the regulator won't be able to turn down the pressure and you're going to have flooding issues since the stock ECU is no longer part of the equation, you're going to need something to run the alternator. So you're going to want to run a wire from the ignition switch that has a resistor in line. And you're going to want to plug it into this wire that's right here. It'll be the second wire from right to left. I have a video showing you guys how to set up your alternator for a carburetor application. Link in the description as well. As for your gauges, if you guys are running this on more of a classic, like 90s, 80s, 70s car, 60s car, anything that uses mechanical gauges or gauges that run standalone to a sensor and doesn't have to go through the computer to get the reading, the only thing you're going to want to do is run the stock coolant temp sensor, stock oil pressure, etc., and run them on the appropriate fittings on the engine. For a coolant temp sensor, you can remove the stock LS sensor or remove the plug on the opposite head. And you can buy the adapters that go from the LS to whatever thread size, metric, or standard that you need to run the correct coolant temperature sensor for your gauges. You're going to want a, a sensor that matches your gauges perfectly. So preferably whatever engine came with your car originally, that's the sensor you're going to want to run. For oil pressure, the LS has a stock oil pressure sensor toward the back of the block to remove the stock LS sensor. You're going to, same thing, you're going to buy an adapter. You're going to go ahead and reuse your oil pressure sensor that you had on the previous engine. If your original engine did not have a sensor for oil pressure or your gauges did not have one, uh, it's not necessary to add one if you don't want to, but it's always helpful. So if you want to add one, these instructions will work exactly the same. I've already done it myself, so I've installed an adapter on mine i'm running the toyota oil pressure sensor right there in the back using an adapter and for the water pump i'm using the toyota coolant temperature sensor i didn't feel like running an adapter on the head so what i ended up doing i drilled and tapped the hole and then used teflon and installed the sensor uh, right there it's an mpt thread so the more i tighten it the tighter the threads got there was no issues for leaking there you guys can see it's a pretty clean install maybe when i change out the water pump because it is starting to leak i will decide to install it on the heads Usually the stock voltmeter is still operational by the time you do your swap because you typically don't need to remove any of that unless it gets the reading off of a voltage regulator or something like that that was part of the stock harness that you ended up removing. Then you're going to need to find out what the wiring is for that. Typically it's only power and ground and you run that to your battery or an ignition switch or whatever you want to run. Everything else for these engines is basically like doing a regular LS swap. I'm going to have links to all these items in the description down below. Also, I'm going to have links to specific items of my different videos for different systems of these engines. If you guys have any questions, go ahead and post them in the comments below. I'll see you guys all in the next one. Night Wrencher out.